Cool. All right. So today we're here with Justin Fork from Talentvine. Justin, how are you doing? I'm very good. How are you? I'm not too bad at all. It's good to have you here. That's very good. Thanks for the invite. No worries. What's what's Talentvine? Uh, we are a recruitment consultant aggregator. Okay. So what we're doing is uh, we're connecting employers to a selection of different recruiters, and then those recruiters have the opportunity to uh, bid on working for a role. So. Okay. Yeah, we're, we're capturing a lot of key metrics and ratings out there in the industry so that uh, employers can now make informed decisions on who the best recruiters are at any given time instead of um, dealing on the sales pitch. And we actually give them uh, a, an easy way to, to find the best people. Brilliant. So what made you come up with that idea? What did you see? Were you a recruiter in a past life? or? Um, actually, I've never been a recruiter. So okay. I think that kind of works quite well, well, has worked quite well for me because I think I was quite naive and was willing to look at things a little bit, uh, you know, kind of differently. I, I think if I had, there probably would have been a few times when I would have wanted to throw into the, the towel and just actually want to be a uh, traditional recruiter. I think when I see how much money some of these really good guys out there are, are making, yeah, um, the uh, startup life is pretty lean in comparison to that so um yeah, yeah no never never was a recruiter i always i worked in recruitment technology uh yeah. in london also in sydney uh psychometric testing video interview screening all those horrible tools that people have to do when they're applying for a large-scale recruitment are they horrible tools they're horrible if you don't like them okay they're the they're nice tools if you are an employer right. and you just want a nice simple way to be able to screen through lots of people yeah um but uh yeah, most, most people don't really see it very fondly when they have to sit down and, and spend 15 minutes to an hour answering questions about your personality. It can be pretty tough. Mm -hmm. You know, the wha what triangle comes next in the series and all those yeah. type ones? Yeah. Yeah, that's me. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Well, psychometric testing is such a, a buzz type word running around at the moment, though. So, you know, it's um, a lot of people are doing it. Yeah, there are a lot of people doing it. And, I mean... I. Like coming from that space, I, I've got to actually admit, I'm not a big believer in the personality aspect of it. Oh, really? Um, yeah, I just think it's quite easy for people to actually game it. You yeah. know, a lot of the time you go in for a job, you know what people want to hear. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a, a lot of the platforms actually, they build that into it and they scale down like your responses, knowing that people oversell themselves yeah, right. um, as well. But I think the cognitive side of it, you know, the problem solving skills, numerical reasoning, verbal reasoning, those type aspects, you can't game that and i think those are really accurate predictors of you know someone's future on the job performance so right you know anyone for our team we, we certainly will test them against their um problem solving skills because that's it doesn't matter what line of work you're in right that's that's I, important I yeah but yeah. What, so with the personality side of it though that's i'm guessing correct me if i'm wrong but that's what people are factoring in for the the cultural fit yeah yeah they are but and and you know what i think it's I think it's useful if, if you're if you're a Westpac, right, and you're for your graduate campaign, you're going to get 5,000 applications coming through. It's just not feasible for you to kind of go through and mm. use, look at everyone who's got a 2-1 degree um, and done six months work experience at Macca's. How do you differentiate one person from the next? That's impossible. So I think, you know, doing doing that kind of personal personality screening at that point where if you're an organization like Westpac, you know, they've identified five key drivers that, uh, you know, that of around personality that someone needs to be successful so you can kind of screen on those get that 5,000 applications down to okay these are the top 100 gotcha. against what we've identified or top thousand let's put those you know thousand through an assessment center or whatever it is so mm -hmm. that works a lot better but i think if you're a small company um you know medium small size you're going to get a much better idea of someone's cultural fit from a 20 minute conversation on right. the phone to them I see. Than, uh, than any piece of paper. I see. And is there specific things you think should be talked about in that phone call or is there a specific pro approach that you think people should take to to test that? Because I've always thought when I, when I work with someone, I always want to test. I don't want to really ask because as you said before, it's the, you know, if, if you know you're being asked a question and there's an expectation of the answer, you're going to give that, right? Yeah. So if, you th if you're testing and someone doesn't know they're being tested, you know, I think that's, I found um, that's a, a better indication of what, you know, who I want to work with anyway. Yeah. Is that a fair assessment or a fair um, description of how you'd approach that phone call? Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, 
if you're having a conversation with someone and you're applying for a job, I think you kind of know in the back of your mind you're being tested mm-hmm. anyway. But mm-hmm. um, that I think that comes down a lot to the actual cu- culture of an organization. You know, there's I can give some some great stories. I know some some digital companies, you know, here in, in Brizzy who have some really cool, um, you know, kind of processes in terms of uh, bring people on board where, you know, it's just a case that there'll be three different people from the company. We'll just go and sit down and, and just have a 20 minute coffee with them. And, they, you know, there's no structured questions. There's nothing like that. It's just getting a flavor, get an idea of, you know what, we're going to spend more time with you in our day to day life than we do with our wives or with, you mm-hmm. know, any of our family, which is true. You know, that's mm-hmm. that's the reality now with, th- um, with your, um, y- you know, the other people that you work with. So I think just having that feel and just getting feel, look, is this someone that I'm happy to be in the trenches with and, um, you know, celebrate with in the good times and, and, and deal with the bad times? And I think, you know, if if you've got the time mm-hmm. to be able to do that, great. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, you know, that's where that's where really good recruiters um, are worth their weight in gold, you know. They save the organization so much time. Yeah, they do. And they've and they've interviewed so many people before, like, you know, thousands of people. So they can right away, they can actually uh, see what their motivators are, mm-hmm. you know, for this person. You know, are they taking this job just because they've been made redundant and they're looking for something before they can move with their wife to the Sunshine Coast? You know, or they know the questions to ask and to probe and to, you know, look at the previous history and see if have they had kind of turnover, why they had turnover, is that going to change now in this next role? Because for those recruiters as well, you've got to remember, they've also got replacement guarantees that they put in place. Yeah. So uh, if they, they screw it up and, and that person leaves, that's uh, they're doing a lot of work for free afterwards. So mm. it's definitely within their, um, you know, motivation to get that right. Yeah, I see. Mm. And why does the, that space need talent vine? Um. Well, for a number of reasons, obviously. <laughs> um, look, yep. I, I think when you speak to people and you say, oh, you know, we're in recruitment technology or, you know, we, we're, we're making it easier for you to, to find who the best recruiters are, everyone's got an opinion of recruiters, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, have you, you, have you had to deal with recruiters applying for roles before? I, ha- I haven't, um, but a lot of my friends have dealt with recruiters and overwhelmingly the the impression I get from the people I hang around with is very negative. Yeah. So, you know, very, it's kind of, I hear cowboy get thrown around a lot. So, you know, so the cowboy (laughs) recruiter who they just chuck someone in a role to make their, their quarterly target or whatever they have to do. Yeah, exactly. No, I I think you would have probably seen a cowboy hat on one of my slides when I I came to a last event, (laughs) actually. Um, Yes, I, I agree. And, and so, you know, there's that big perception that's out there that, that people hate recruiters right but mm-hmm. it, it's not true the reality is people hate shit recruiters yeah you know are we allowed to say the s word on yeah here? go for yeah, it cool. say whatever word you want okay cool i will do <laughs> <laughs> um yeah they, they 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 hate the shit ones you know when you work with a, a recruiter and they find you're an amazing candidate you know it's done with high level of service it's done at on terms and a fee that you the employer and the recruiter are happy with then that's a perfect situation right and everyone's happy and no one complains about the process when that happens. Um, you know, so that in itself is essentially the hiring utopia, to use a bit of a cliche term, that we want to facil- facilitate through our platform. So we're not trying to eliminate the work that recruiters do. And actually, when I first launched the business, was I was trying to eliminate the work that recruiters do. I see. Um, and never actually having been one myself, I just, you know, thought, oh, ballsy, you know what, I can come and make this <laughs> huge change. But then you actually start looking at your your metrics and where you're actually getting your money from. And it's when the recruiters are most involved with the clients and they're worth their weight in gold. And I, I had this big realization of, okay, this is now when we pivot because we're not about trying to eliminate recruiters. We're now about making it easier to identify and now to work with the best recruiters that are out there in the market. Mm-hmm. And that's now where we're finally getting some gold. Awesome. Mm. And how's it been received by recruiters? How how's it been received by the space? Um, you know what? In the very initial days, I was told under no uncertain terms by quite a few recruiters that they did not like wh- <laughs> what I was doing. Okay. Uh, you know, you're going to be cutting into our fees, and uh, you know, you're kind of cheapening the service and everything that that we do. But um, you know, in a way, I take some of the, I, I take quite a lot of the blame for that because I almost. Are approached it in quite an arrogant way in terms of um you know 
hey recruiters you kind of need our platform because we're going to send you jobs right and you just want to make money and i just thought that that was a situation i was like so if you don't want to sign up on here your employers your competitors are and they're going to be winning more work than you and the the um th there are some exceptions of some some great recruiters that, that i had on um you know uh, aaron thomas from digital native like he was awesome when he was over at um at uh, davidson he was you know happy to come on very early days and you know that gave me a little bit of um uh, what's the word um credibility having sure. someone like like the, you know davidson on, on the platform but yeah there were, there were quite a few that told me you know it's never going to work it, it won't work so i i really had to kind of you know bluff it or you know fake it in the early days where uh i think a lot of entrepreneurs do you know you go out to the clients and you're like oh yeah, yeah i've got all these recruiters on the platform yeah you know they were ready to kind of bid bid on in on a role and then a a client will put a role up on the platform and then I'd spend the next 24 hours just frantically right. calling around recruiters and being like, hey, I've got a client who's looking to hire a, uh, a CTO with yeah. this stack, you know, can you please place a bit on this? You know, <laughs> So uh, that's how I built up the business, you right. know, roll by roll kind of a, as it went. So um, yeah, people weren't very receptive at first. Um, now now we've, we've got some great recruiters on board. Um, we're kind of at a point where we've got a bit of a waiting list now as well with recruiters. We just need more employers um, oh, brilliant. now. So yeah, it's a good, good place. Sure. So um, on this podcast, we talk about the hard times you push through in your journey. So would it be fair to say that um, that was one of your toughest times is early on when you um, came in, it seems all, <laughs> you know, firing all guns blazing um, in the recruiting space. Yeah, I, th I think it was. Um, yeah, th th that's, it certainly was. I mean, I, I, I hated my, the last job that I was in, so I just kind of knew that as soon as possible I was going to get out there and, and just kind of launch a business. I, um, I did what no one should ever do and take out a business loan about a week before I was going to quit. Oh wow! Um, yeah, right. And not yeah, a personal loan, you know, pretty much. Right. So, um, you know, thinking that oh, I've got this great idea for a business yeah. and I'm going to be able to pay this back in two months because obviously people are going to want to pay to use it within a week. Um, so yeah, I just I was clueless. I had no idea what I was doing. Um, but yeah, that was, I, I think. I I got a sense of false hope because when I had nothing but a, a one page website and some business cards printed off. I met someone at a, um, uh, a, I met a client at a networking event. She was looking to hire a uh, CIO and I kind of pitched the concept to her. So she said, yeah, that's great, we'll do that. Anyway, long story short, within three weeks, managed to find her an awesome person that she ended up hiring um, and saved her 12,000 bucks like on any, on any other, uh, you know, anyone else that she had dealt with. So, so straight away off the bat, I was like, oh my God, this works. And that was so easy to get this client on board. So if that's the amount of effort I took to get one client, uh, times that by 10, that's what I can do, you know, in half a day, I'm going to have be making a hundred grand a month <laughs> straight away. So, yeah. and then realizing for a few months after that, not making a single dollar, it was like, okay, yeah, this is, this is quite a, a dark time. This is, this is pretty hard. It's, a, um, and then it kind of dawned on me the magnitude of, I think what it actually takes to launch a startup. Right. And, and what, what do you put it down to getting that first client easily versus then, I suppose, going into the valley, valley of death by the sounds and not picking up one for a long time? Um, I think a lot of it was just not, I, I had no idea what I was doing. Um, you know, I moved from Sydney as well. So I was, I was living down and I was living in Bondi, which is great. And uh, when you've got a nice corporate salary and uh, suddenly decided to launch business and realized how quickly your money disappears when you're living in the, in uh, Sydney's Eastern beaches. Hmm. So, um, yeah, moved my whole life up to the sunny coast to live on my, with my mate on his, on his couch and everything for, which was meant to be for about three or four weeks while mm -hmm. I got stuff like business plans and stuff that I thought you needed when you have a startup, which right. you don't, um, get that all, all done. So yeah, that was a, a, a big move kind of going up there, but there were some very kind of supportive people you know around me but i still had didn't know what i was doing you know to get from that kind of concept stage to to actual kind of proof of concept so now that i look back i think 90 percent of the time that i spent doing stuff was just wasted right um so i would put that down to to it but yeah i think the main thing was just not knowing what i'm doing and and i and I think I, I said this, you know, at the, the last event as well. I think just surrounding yourself by people who've been there before, who've learned, who've failed, mm. and just p 
pick their brain relentlessly, so I wish I'd done that. Do you need to fail yourself first, though? Do you need to fail yourself? Or? Yeah, fail yourself. So you, when you, would you have listened to those people if they were around you? I mean, because I, I, mm. I see, I talk to a lot of people. Um, I don't know why, but people tend to come to me and ask me how to start an app oh or yeah? something, and I don't know much about it, to be honest. <laughs> but I get, I get that question a bit from sort of people who know I'm in this space, but I suppose my friends and you know the ad- another world. So they come along and ask about, oh, you know, I w- want to start this app. I've got this great idea. Yeah. And uh, I am, and it's, it happened yesterday actually. And I'm, I toss up whether to give the, because I've I've tried to launch apps and failed miserably before. Yeah. And I toss up between whether to give the, you know, the the brutal reality. But if I do that, they don't start. Yeah. So, versus giving, sort of enough info to, tr- to try and get them started so they can have a taste of the game and mm. see if they like it from there mm. so it's a great question actually um oh actually before what apps did you launch oh um i <laughs> i released an app called the playbook <laughs> back in the day so it was just a um if you're in a bar and you wanted to meet someone and you didn't know what to say it would have a, a lot of pre free um loaded lines there for you to nice <laughs> to that it you could use so because if you didn't i don't know what to say i don't i want to meet someone but i don't know what to say so it just gave you that first uh, just a line to use to start a conversation what were some of the better lines in there oh god we're going down this rabbit hole <laughs> <laughs> um i really like if you walk up to a group of people and say hey sorry i'm late and you don't know them they're strangers that's pretty cool <laughs> i like that <laughs> so that's an example of one but anyway, we're getting sidetracked here. Sorry. So, okay. <laughs> so but my point is, I thought before doing that, for example, or before doing other businesses that I launched, I thought the idea, you know, I thought it was brilliant. Great. This is going to work for sure. Mm. And then you, you, you get the, the reality hit that the idea means not that much on its own. Mm. Ideas, are sh- ideas are shit. Execution is everything. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's. That's a great question, and to be honest, maybe if I knew how hard it was, I, I, I probably wouldn't have started. I wouldn't have started either. Yeah, I. So that's a good thing, right? It's mm. a good thing that I that I didn't know that. Um, you mm. know, um, naivety is uh, you know is is really quite useful. But I, th- you know, I think having that kind of sense of of naivety, you st- entrepreneurs, we are incredibly optimistic people, though, right? You know, we. I don't think you have to be incredibly optimistic because you just get you get hit so many times along this this path that you know if you if you weren't and you did you didn't see some magical um way to actually exit with 26 million dollars um yeah. you know after three years you, you yeah. wouldn't really be doing it um mm-hmm. so yeah I'm, I'm glad i didn't know everything about it but i think if i just had some people there um just you know i think there's some you know, 10 key milestones that you can kind of, that you should be aiming to kind of hit like in your first six months, you know, mm-hmm. okay, g- get it, you know, proof of concept, all right, get the, you know, get certain things built that actually prove that th- this is going to be, um, uh, be, be viable. Because, I mean, for example, like what I did, right, was never having been a recruiter. So I went and, and spoke to all these employers and everyone's complaining, oh, we hate recruiters so much. Okay, what do you hate about them? Oh, that's, that's so expensive. Okay, cool. So what I'll do is I'll create a platform and I'll just connect you to the cheapest recruiters that are out there. Um, and, you know, recruit and employers are like, yeah, great idea, cool. So I did that and I just went around to all the recruiters who's willing to do it for the lowest price and then, okay, cool, I put and then put them in touch. And then you just get shitty candidates being sent through by <laughs> B-class recruiters and, and no one makes money at the end of the day. So I think that if I'd actually known what to actually ask them and actually, you know, it took me a good six to 12 months to actually realize actually it's not the price, you know, that's mm-hmm. not the the big issue here. Mm-hmm. But they told you it was. Yeah, they told me it was. Right. So you can't take, you, s- you can't take what people say at face value necessarily. Is that the lesson here? Yeah, I, th- I think, I, I think that's the lesson. I think for, uh, I've, I've said to quite a few people before as well who are trying to launch something, you know, people will often say oh that's a great idea yeah i'll definitely use it okay cool uh, you know would you be willing to pay for it though i think is a completely different question mm-hmm. and uh, you know even someone saying yes i'll pay for it to them actually saying okay well can i have your credit card details and i'll put it in mm-hmm. uh yeah you know it's a whole different killer right. then you get the truth then then you yeah then you get the truth so i 
it, you know, there's it's that kind of chicken and egg situation though with the the entrepreneurship thing. You you can't really justify you know taking someone's credit card details until you've got some form of a product. Mm -hmm. um, but I think yeah, understanding the market, speaking to as many people as possible. I would have done that a lot differently. Um, I would have spoken to more of the recruiters before. Really? Yeah. Okay. So I just took all my advice from what do employers want? Mm -hmm. um, okay. Well, recruiters just want to win more roles. So as long as I just send you jobs that way, they'll be happy. But yeah, I got it wrong on both sides of things. Very interesting. Very interesting. So if you were to tell someone else what what they should do in their first two weeks, for example, what would that be just simply talking to people in the space? Yeah, first two weeks, learn how to meditate. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. Um, yeah, d get, it, get, yourself, um, get yourself set up where you know, you're going to be surrounded by, by people on the, on the same journey as you, you know, I'm, I'm not sure what it's like yet at gravity, but you know, certainly if I had a tech company and day one, I wanted to get started in somewhere like river city labs, mm -hmm. you know, I think that would be amazing because you can just turn around and you can just straight away, you can ask people, Hey, I've got this problem with this. What would you suggest? There's mentors, there's, there's support. I'm not trying to plug them or anything at all. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's a lot of these kind of incubators and everything that are setting up now across the country. And, um, I think that's incredibly valuable, you know, not only getting that little bit of money behind you that allows you to take some risks, um, but at the same time, yeah, just being able to pick people's brains mm -hmm. is really big. And what about the art of doing that? Because, I mean, when I started in business, I think that I, my questions were poor mm. to the people I was talking to because the, the client or the pe person you're trying to serve, I feel, doesn't always know what they want or they don't know how to explain what they want mm. and I've almost felt like over time there's an art to actually asking the right questions digging in the right you know in yeah. the right spaces was that something that come naturally to you or would did you have to develop the skill to actually get the important information you needed from people um I think I think the only skill that I really had in that area was being brave brave enough to ask people for help right. I, I think one thing that really surprised me was actually how generous people are and how supportive and how willing they are to be able to kind of share what they've learned as part of their own journey as well. So um, I was I was at some random event and I was just sat opposite a, a guy who was surrounded by investors and, and this dude was sat there with like a crumpled shirt and you know, half shave and, and there was just something about him. He just looked really interesting. I remember I wrote down like what was on his name badge went and checked him out on LinkedIn that night, saw he was ex KPMG, ex Apple, ex Microsoft. Um, so, and I just like hit him up that next morning, just said, look, I sat opposite you. I didn't have the, you know, I, I wasn't brave enough to say hello. Please, can we chat? I'm starting this kind of startup thing. I have no idea what to do. Um, that was Mark Phillips. Uh, so he's like um, the, uh, the, uh, the barefoot mentor, I think kind of calls himself. So he was amazing. So he was the first kind of mentor on that that I had. And um, so yeah, just a lot of other people I find, you know, CEOs and, and really senior people, I think just being honest with them, you know, I think quite a lot of people will do that. Um, will want to try and set up a meeting with someone to get advice, but secretly be trying to sell something. Right. Um, and I think people can pick up on that quite a, a way and uh, quite easily. And um, so I think being genuine, and I think if you sit down with people and you can say, look, I genuinely, I have no idea kind of where to start. This is what I think would work. What have you learned? Mm. You know, and just being able to be that open, let yourself, you know, be, um, you know, show that you are kind of quite, quite naive and, um, mm -hmm. and, and just be willing to learn, right? I think that's the important thing. And if you can go, if you can then show those people that actually you've gone and put their advice into, into action, yep. come back to them and say, hey, look, your advice was amazing. I've actually done this as a result. Yep. This then, is uh, what happened. This is what happens. Yep. And, you know, they, they'll be, they'll know that you are, um, you know, you're going to respond to their advice and, and they'll um, introduce you to more and more people and it works that way. Right. So did you, did you used to approach people and ask for um, advice and perhaps you were looking to push something on the side or is that something that you've never done? Uh, it's something that I have done. <laughs> okay. Actually. Yeah. Right. Um, I w yeah. I will admit that I, um, that there have been a couple of times um, when I have done it where I think being in the space that I'm at, at you know, the, it's quite often I would find like founders or entrepreneurs, you know, who've got kind of tech companies and then I'd be like, hey, this is what I'm trying to do. And I think because everyone's had that kind of problem 
with some form of recruiters at some point or another. Yeah. Um, quite often business owners would be quite open and quite interested to hear what we were trying to do because I think we were genuinely are solving a real problem. Mm-hmm. Um, so I would be able to get in the door sometimes and then, you know, Act, I've, I'd kind of seen an ad they might have had on Seek or um, Stack Overflow or something <laughs> like that. And then uh, halfway through, they would actually be like, oh, actually, we're trying to actually, we're looking for someone at the moment. So, um, yeah, do you want to try it? Right. So, yeah, that did work. Um, okay. But, you know, I, I do think that a couple of them saw through it. Right. Okay. Yeah. So, but you, did, but you did go in there with that intent. So, if you hadn't have gone in there with that intent, you think that would have um, been a better long-term strategy yeah it's a good question i mean long term yes but you know when you're when you're an early founder and you're fighting in the trenches yeah you, you need that money right yeah, you've right. got to be willing to take risks you've got to be willing to um i think realize that you're going to piss some people off um it's not a popularity contest but you know you know, now that i guess you know we're not desperate to, to kind of survive month on month you know and we we actually have a business and we know what our values are and we know what our vision is and you know our actions should be communicating that kind of every day so i think trying to trick people in that way mm-hmm. yeah I, I wouldn't i wouldn't be comfortable doing that anymore right but, but yes i did it and if you're listening i'm sorry you <laughs> probably know who you are <laughs> <laughs> well it's like the um it's it's like this paradox so that, that a lot of business owners go through at some point in time is we're all told to play the long game but we don't have time to play the long game yeah exactly so you gotta you gotta you know, chase some short term money sometimes unfortunately yeah. yeah yeah you you really do um mm-hmm. you know you've you've gotta survive I think that's the number one rule in those mm-hmm. early days just survive don't run out of money yeah and yeah so how long's talent vine been around now uh we've been a business so it was two years last month okay mm. cool yeah felt like five yeah <laughs> <laughs> right and you were a child actor. Yeah, I was. Well, I l- use that term quite loosely, but um, yeah, I did some very random adverts, actually. Um, Colk and pork pies. I did pork pies. I did uh, some canned beef. Mm-hmm. I did a um, soup mix and a Zimbabwe. Right. So you, uh, so you, you were advertising these products, I'm assuming? Oh, uh, yeah, I was. Yeah. Okay. Well, I was either the child playing in the background, or um, or yeah, I was right. the, the the hero image on there. Interesting. On the and I kind of jumped to that a little too abruptly. Then <laughs> it didn't <laughs> quite make sense, but um, I, I suppose I was interested because I see here you've done Iron Man. You know, you've been a competitive Iron Man before as well. Um, do you do you see yourself as an ambitious person? Have you always pushed yourself to um, do things beyond what a lot of other people perhaps are capable of? Um, yes, I'd, I'd say I definitely am like that now. Mm-hmm. Um, I try and, yeah, think quite big and, and do quite big things. I, Iron Man was just always a, a huge kind of pipe dream of, of mine to be able to, I thought if I could do that, then I can really do anything. Right. Um, but I was, I was pretty lazy when I was at school. Right. Um, and I didn't really try very hard in, in the classroom or on the sports field. So a lot of it is kind of guilt as well. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, now I kind of thought, well, I definitely, I didn't push myself closely enough. So time to do it now in my kind of late twenties, early thirties. So yeah. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So yeah, I wait, waited a bit long. I mean, I actually wanted to join the army when I was, when I was a bit younger, cause I just thought, you know, that would be a great way to show how macho I am and see how far I can push myself both mentally and physically. But I just thought, so uh, get a lot, push yourself quite as far or I don't know. Maybe not as far, but by doing Iron Man and launching your own business, I guess. That's yeah. That's the. Do you, do you still compete? Um, I'm about eight kgs more than I should be at okay. my race weight. Okay. Uh, I compete shorter races now, so I don't really have the the time to be able to do 20, 20 yeah. hour, 25 hour um, training weeks. Running a startup will do that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And uh, there's always a lot of events at River City Labs of free pizza as well, which doesn't help. Right, yeah. Mm. So, y- so you mentioned that you were, um, you feel guilty for not quite putting in at school and um, in, the, in the classroom and in the sp- on the sports field. Uh, what were you like in school? Um, yeah, I was just, I was really rebellious. I just never really liked, um, 
I, I wasn't really made for anything institutionalized. Um, so I just coasted through school, did the did the kind of bare minimum, so I could just be there and smoke cigarettes behind the shed and um, right. you know, mess around with friends and play in the third team rugby and. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's kind of what I did, but yeah, I got uh, you know in Zimbabwe, th- the school schooling there is a little bit wilder. So you know, I I did stuff like break into the prefect's common room and oh wow. put mud in their coffee and got oh wow. caught and <laughs> they put two hundred and seventy <laughs> boys on me and um, right had six months of back rehab and stuff like oh that. God. So uh, yeah, it was a uh, interesting place to grow up. But yeah, that's kind of what I was like at school. Not not oh the wow. best person to deal with. Yeah. Right, yeah. and and. So did you, were you still rebellious after school? Like, is that a trend that kept going or did you, how did you change once you left school or did you change? I think I grew out of being rebellious, but um, I definitely don't buy into kind of society's expectations of, you know, what we should do to be kind of successful, you know, get, finish school, get a uni degree, get a comfortable job pay your taxes get married have kids get a mortgage and that's you for the rest of your life you know Mm -hmm. that um that doesn't interest me um, in the slightest so i think i'm rebellious in 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 that way Mm -hmm. uh you know being is that just critical thinking then (laughs) i mean if you want to watch people lose their minds one one strategy i've got is to say that buying a house might not be the best financial investment and people go absolutely crazy over it. it's (laughs) such an irrational topic I find, um, but that's the same thing. It's it's what you're saying is don't just buy it because, you know, society tells you. You know, crunch the numbers, and often they don't look that good. Exactly. Yeah, completely agree. And uh, it's yeah, it's definitely easy for me to use that as an excuse at the moment when you when you put all your money into a business <laughs> and you don't have uh, I- anything left as a as a deposit. But yeah, I, I agree. I mean, one of my um, one of my investors, she's uh, incredibly. Um, you know, successful CEO of a, a company that's going to be working with the likes of, uh, you know, Tesla and that. And oh, wow. um, uh, yeah, she's, she could probably, I mean, she could buy heaps of houses. She, she doesn't believe in it whatsoever. She still rents, you know. Right. So um, that was someone who told me quite early, early on that actually, you know, the whole housing thing um, isn't that good. And I just, I like having a certain level of, of freedom as well, you know, so I, d- I don't particularly feel that I want to have kids or anything mm-hmm. as well and don't want a mortgage because I want to be able to say actually you know what I want to go and work in the valley for two years or move to Zurich or you know yep. travel on Africa for a year so yep I like that element of freedom that and and I don't think a mortgage would help no no <laughs> it'd, be, it'd be quite restrictive I imagine yeah um okay so I, I quite reson I, I resonate with a lot of the points you're making there with the rebellious stuff I was actually quite good at school but uh um I don't think that really helped me. I did well at school, so I, I, I skipped a year and, you know, school told me I was smart and all this type of thing. And then I, I, I felt like I took this arrogance into um, my early adult life. Mm. And there's nothing like starting a business to get kicked in the teeth every week and <laughs> to kind of bring you back down to earth. Yeah. So I actually wonder whether you had a leg up on a lot of us there because because from someone who, who did well at school, I... I didn't do... I, I was very slow off the mark in business. Really? Yeah. And what did you think... Do, do you reckon that's because you thought it was going to be easier than yep. it was? And, I, and because I was smart. Yeah. Because yeah. school told me and uh, that I was a smart person. Uh, yeah. But that's such a... You know... <laughs> that, that's It's such a lazy way of describing someone, mm. I think, now. Mm. because you know business is all these things you have to learn about it and all these skills that you have to develop and and my social skills weren't particularly strong especially in the beginning so i thought that my you know intellect would overcome that but not the case because you need to deal with people yeah yeah um yeah that's that's quite interesting i mean i think like when i do those like psychometric tests uh, you know tests and that like i generally come up quite quite high so i think thankfully uh, i think my intellect is is maybe okay but i'm not very good at you know learning like or being i think it's being told what to learn you know so that's what i struggled at school um i 
I started uni and I dropped out of uni. I started an MBA, dropped out of my MBA. I think because going through that, I just started getting restless. And I was like, why am I learning all this stuff that I'm never going to do myself? I'm always just going to find someone smarter than me yeah. and outsource it and get them to do a much better job than I'll ever do. And I'll just focus on what I'm good at. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, yeah, that uh, I kind of picked up on, on that. But um, I think maybe the good thing about being rebellious was i just got that out of my system when i was quite young mm. you know so I now see. i'm now i'm okay with the fact that i'm you know paying myself a, a pittance and yeah you know not being very exciting on friday and saturday nights right um so maybe you know that's that's an aspect as, as well you don't want to still be going and partying really hard i think when you're in your late 30s and trying to run a business do you? Mm, fair enough no maybe not <laughs> have you got it out of your system? Uh, I don't know if I can say I have, <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, but uh, yeah, no, very interesting. I mean, I was talking to someone last night about this topic exactly, and they were talking about uh, uni, and they're still at uni actually. And they, they said, you know, they really like the structure of being told what to learn. Mm. But it sounds like you're not the type of person who, who likes that. And I said, oh, you yeah, know, I was, I said, I can't stand that. I can't even. And they said they can see that some of it's a waste of time but they mm. can tolerate the waste of time whereas i'm not a type of person who can tolerate that perhaps you're not either uh no not not really but i i would like to have better um i'd like to be better at taking advice i think oh, right. sometimes i can i can be quite kind of headstrong and um make my mind up about something mm -hmm. um i've been told that by my board Right. <laughs> that, uh, maybe I should listen sometimes a little <laughs> bit better. Um, so that's definitely an area of development for me mm -hmm. that I should work on. Right. Yeah. It's a catch-22 though, isn't it? Because how do you decipher what advice to take and what not? Yeah, that's, that's very true. And, you know, some of the some of the advice that I have ignored has, has, has paid off, you mm -hmm. know, and, and I definitely have made, made the right decision from there. So, yeah, I think it's, you know, experience just trumps so much right mm -hmm. just being out there and just figuring it out yourself mm -hmm. um you know i've got having really good advisors around me you know who i can i can ask them stuff but every every situation is always different you know so the best thing i can often get from them is is just say look well what i've seen happen in a ser similar situation is this so your options are x y and z and then you've just got to um figure it out for yourself and just deal with the consequences i think but make yeah. calculated decisions, right? Yeah. You create. We create our own luck. Yep. Um, you know, there's a lot of luck, I think, in 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 this game, but mm -hmm. it, most of it is is created by ourselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Fair call. Mm. Um, on that topic, so I ask uh, I ask everyone this every episode. Do you have any challenges with self doubt? Oh, yeah, heaps. Heaps. Daily. Yeah. Weekly. Yeah. Oh, daily. Um, <laughs> yeah. Like my my internal dialogue that I have in myself is, is absolutely shocking. Right. Um, you know, I, I really shouldn't. I, I would never, I would, I would want to punch someone if I heard them talking to another person. Really? In, in the way that I kind of talk to myself. So, uh, yeah, that's that's something that I, um, that I'm, I'm not very good at. But, you know, there are kind of tools that I, you know, I, I'm, I'm very kind of mindful, you mm -hmm. know, and I, and I do try and do the whole kind of meditating um, you know, and clearing and focusing and can gratitude and focusing on the good stuff and that, and, and that certainly helps. I actually, it was, uh, in the last couple of weeks, there was, I was listening to a, um, Tim Ferriss, uh, podcast. And I think it was, it was Tim Ferriss and Gary Vee. Actually, they were together. No way. Were yeah. they? Yeah. Are you sure? Yeah. I've really wanted that podcast to happen. I'm pretty sure it hasn't happened. Yeah, it's happened. Are you sure? Yeah, definitely. Oh my God. Yeah, it was them together. Okay. And uh, Tim Ferriss was saying that, um, you know, just just pick something small. You know, what we always do and what I think I always do is I set myself these huge kind of ambitious goals of, of what I, I want to achieve that week or, or that month. And, and, you know, you very rarely actually hit it, right? So then, and then I just feel like a failure and I, and I, and I failed. And, and uh, what Tim was saying was just set kind of just micro goals. And he used the example of um, Rick Rubin, you know, the, the music producer. Um, when he has, uh, when he has musicians and that who who just going through a slump, they've they've just got this musical block and they can't get anything out. He just says to them, just okay, w do you think tomorrow you can just write one line for me, just one line or just two words 
that you think would be good lyrics. That's all I want. And if you've done that, that's a success. You know, they can, as soon as they can kind of just do that, they feel, all right, well, that was a success. I, I did what I set out to do. And it sounds completely counterintuitive, but he says, you know, set micro goals for yourself. So this is something that I've started doing in, in the last couple of weeks. And this has actually happened to me. You know, I just said, okay, just, you know, a really micro kind of KPI of, all right, if you just get that done every day, then leave feeling that you've succeeded. Right. You know? And so suddenly having five days in a row where I actually felt, oh, I actually succeeded today. Mm-hmm. Um, my mind shift really changed. You know, it just wow. just from that. So, can you give us an example of one of those KPIs, like a micro KPI you've set? Yeah, just n- a certain number of calls. Okay. You know that that I should that I need to make. So whether yep. it's to to employers or recruiters that I'm that I'm kind of working with. Yep. Um, you know, I know I, I look at the funnel and you know it's kind of the bare minimum that I need to do to kind of kind of break even, and it's just so easy w- when you're focusing on everything else to let that kind of sales and business development aspect yeah. slip away. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, so if I if I can sit down do you know, ten before ten calls before ten o'clock. Yep. Um. Then I sweet. I've I've won. Now I can actually focus on and get a lot of other stuff done. And as soon as you've you feel good and that you've got that momentum and it just kind of drives you forward for the rest of the day and then the week. Mm-hmm. And and with the meditation stuff, is that is that something you do regularly? I mean, I've tried to do it myself and I really struggle to stick with it. I really struggle to quiet the mind and actually spend fifteen minutes doing nothing. You know. Um, what how, what was your experience with starting that and where you're at with it now? Um, yeah, it's 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 still something that I, I find really hard. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's just routine. I think as soon as I kind of brought it into my, my morning routine of knowing, okay, as soon as I, like I, I do some weird stuff, as, as soon as I wake up, I get up and have some apple cider drink and warm water and then okay. um, sit, on, sit on my floor and, and do like a 15-minute guided meditation so right. i actually do the guided ones i find when i try and do it on my own i just start thinking of everything so i'm, mm-hmm. I'm not there yet yep um yeah so as long as it's kind of routine it's a lot easier to to kind of follow and i can feel how different i am that day whether i have meditated or not wow that um, day yeah yeah that day okay yeah it's it's certainly. and well, could, could you explain what the difference is if if what would your day look like if you didn't versus if you did um, if I don't, it's just a lot more kind of um, frantic, okay. I think, and uh, you know, just just dealing with stuff. Whereas, if I do, if I do that kind of meditation and kind of throughout the meditation, the guided meditation, I'm focusing on what I want to achieve for that day. You know, what I see is that you know, how I want to be feeling at the end of the day, um, and and then just subconsciously, I think your body and your mind just starts going through. Okay, well that's where you've got to be so this is what's got to be done and i just find that that's kind of in the back of my mind throughout the day so i might be focused on on doing something which is not that important and then i might actually i need to be doing this call so i get pulled away and then I actually do what's uh, the important stuff which mm-hmm. gets me to the goal at the end awesome so so how did you was there a, a lag period when you started before you started to feel the um, sorry, I'll rephrase that. So, was there a period of time before you started feeling the positive effects of it, or did you? Was it a pretty quick? You started meditating, and these, you know, y- you could notice your days improve immediately. I I think I get immediate benefit wow. from that. Yeah, yeah. Even when you started doing it, even when you first started meditating. Oh well, I mean, I started I started kind of doing it a, a few years ago, and then probably had about a two year period when I maybe <laughs> did it once or twice. Nice. Um, so probably about the last three months. I've okay. been uh, been doing it a lot more again, and yeah, I've I'm seeing the benefits from that already. Brilliant. And, and but yes, same day, like right away. If if I, um, because what happens? Uh, so this is what happens if I don't meditate, right? My alarm goes off. I sit there and then I scroll through the news. Yep. Go on CNN, see if Trump has been assassinated <laughs> yet. Um, scroll through Instagram, Facebook, yep. check emails, check Twitter, yep. do all the stuff. And the next thing I know, you know, half an hour, 45 minutes is gone. That's how I've started the day. That's kind of set the tone for the day. I'm thinking about Trump. I'm thinking yep. about, you know, what competitor tweeted this. And that, uh, and that's when I feel quite frantic, right? Because there's right. been no kind of structure. Whereas I know that if I, if I get out, and I do that kind of morning routine that I know kind of works for me, mm-hmm. then I'm more likely to stick to a routine and have a structured day. Yeah, from the start. Right. Mm. That's a that's a a very valid point. I think. I, I, like, in, in just you speaking like that right now is reminding me that I probably start most of my days in in chaos mode at the moment. 
you can go you can go you can start reading emails and get pretty angry pretty quickly sometimes yeah in the morning yeah exactly that's um yeah i'll i'll, I'll read an email and yeah it'll it'll set me off and and that's me and that's what mm. i'm focused on for the for the for the rest of the day so if you do do meditating um i don't do it enough but when i have done kind of journaling as well like oh yeah. cause sometimes I struggle with sleeping like i have I, i'd sleep very badly so yep. um if i can do that at night time and sometimes and just get it down on paper and a lot of the time you actually realize oh my god i've been stressing all day about this and when you're actually reading it you actually realize how trivial it is mm. and it's almost kind of out of your mind right um because it, yeah you can read it on a piece of paper i suppose yeah you can yeah. and and you, you and i just find it's almost it's out of you mm-hmm. you know and i think just you know we can build something into so much more than it really is and then yep. when you actually write it down yeah you're, you're like that's not even something i should be stressing about mm. and i even remember the other day i was i was really cranky in the morning because i felt like i had all this stuff to do mm. and i probably should have set the micro goals like you were saying but an hour later and it was pretty much all done it just <laughs> felt like there was a lot of a lot of things to do because the list was huge but they were only like two minutes each most of the tasks yeah and i was just annoyed that i had to do all this stuff and i think i get more annoyed when it's a there's a chance of conflict like if i have to call someone or deal with other humans i'm, I'm mm. pretty good if it's just a task i do myself where i control all the variables but if i see four or five phone calls or you know four or five things where i need to deal with other people mm. that that annoys me even if they only take two minutes each yeah okay yeah so, so do you um like are, are you good with lists are you a fan of lists do you, do you write them and, and tick things off i do them yes and I, i'm not sure if i'm a fan i don't know i haven't found a better way mm. would be my answer to that um i because I, my problem with lists is you easy do it and then if it's too long you just don't want to get started. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because it just looks so overwhelming. So coming back to your point again before, you know, it's better to have those micro goals perhaps that aren't so overwhelming than you get started. Yeah. No, I, I, I agree. I find, um, I find I like lists because something I used to s- struggle with a lot more as well was, um, I'm trying to think how, how they said that, that, task at hand will always be filled by the time you have available that's uh what, parkinson's law is that oh i don't know yeah you know more than me the um so if you have um two weeks to do something versus a day yeah you'll get it done just on time yeah typically it, yeah pr- exactly but I, I i do that like sometimes if i don't have a list i'll be like okay, same as you okay there's these kind of six calls i need to do this and oh there's all these kind of emails in my inbox yeah and i just kind of do stuff as and when it kind of comes through whereas as soon as i have a list i'm like okay i can prioritize it just get those three shitty things done out yeah of the way mm-hmm. and then you get a bit of momentum or like those micro goals right yeah right and then keep going and i mean i, I love lists to the extent where sometimes i'll do something that wasn't on my list and i'll write it down <laughs> ju- just so i can and cross, then cross it, it up, up. <laughs> 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 oh, very nice That's pretty sad um no now i have to go down another rabbit hole because you mentioned sleep here so i've um i'm a bit of a sleep um freak at the moment because i was um diagnosed with sleep apnea about six months ago oh wow and i've now i've I'm come out the other side of that and quality of life has gone up tenfold my productivity has gone through the roof i can do it i can do a 12 hour day now and that's fine i can wow. i can get through it so I'd be Wh- interested. What was the change? Oh, I go therapy. So you actually see, it's called CPAP. So it, it, it basically sleep apnea is where if you you go to sleep at night and you, um, your airways will collapse, mm-hmm. and if they collapse for too long, you have to semi wake up to, to wake to open the airways back up again. But oh. the problem with that is that if you keep doing that all night, you never get restful sleep. Mm. So it's this kind of vicious cycle. So now I'm I'm obsessed with sleep at the moment. So would be so interested to hear why you like w- you, you talk about sleep, and I actually think it's so important, mm. you know, for us, if we, you know, in this game as well, and trying to, um, you know, it just it's just the foundation of of my day anyway. I've, yeah. I've learned and and just how how much I've improved in you know getting that right. So mm. do you 
do you, do you stress yourself and you don't get to sleep or is it you wake up or what 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 is your challenge yeah i do i think um i've just got a, a having an overactive mind yeah um, i'll yeah. it's that you know wake up at two in the morning you're like oh my god you know it's either an idea or something that you forgot to do or something right. like that and then um you know i can i get myself kind of yeah, quite anxious or something about it and then once you're in that point it's just really hard to to go back to sleep again so um yeah that's that's my problem mm-hmm. um, with that and then you know if i'm trying to work or you know even just looking at your phone and stuff like that too late at night i find yep. then it can be be quite distracted so mm-hmm. yeah i think having that that routine there can can certainly help as well so you know something's on your mind write it down get it out um having you know your 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 bedroom should be it, it's got to be something you know, it's really kind of peaceful so mm. i don't do any work in bed anymore like i used to um you know i'd sit there on my laptop before i go to bed and then you kind of associate your bed with being somewhere where there's work and there's yep. a stress and that anxiety from those emails you don't want to get and all that so <laughs> my bed now is just you know it that's just there, there for kind of sleeping and yep. it's um uh, like i have it's pretty funny i've i've even have like decorative pillows and stuff on, right. my, on my bed which is very emasculating <laughs> um but to me uh, like and i make my bed every single you know every single morning and everything mm-hmm. because that whole kind of almost a ceremonial thing of like okay it's time for bed yeah and uh now take off you know the pillows and, and get in a freshly made bed that just helps me mm. you know, sleep so it's it's been kind of trial and error mm-hmm. and figuring out what works right very interesting have a few potions yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> brilliant yeah. all right and uh, there's um this other thing you, you might um I, I tried recently called sensory deprivation therapy have you tried that before oh no, is that like those float tanks yeah no i haven't yeah I money though yeah so that might be useful as well so did that help you what by doing that w- th- that affects how you sleep then oh no, more so with the you're talking about the the where you wake up and you feel like doing something you know, in the middle of the night, it's kind of that quieting of the mind, I suppose, because you're in there and you float, you're floating on the water and it's dark. So you can't see, you can't, well, you can kind of hear your own breathing. Um, you can't smell, obviously, or, you know, it's meant to take away the senses. Mm. Very, very relaxing. Extremely relaxing. Yeah. I'd love to do that. I'm yeah. Su- super keen. So. Okay. I'm kind of recommending that to, to everyone these days because it's such a, it was, it was amazing for me. All right. Um, I'll do it. Const- I've got want to do it uh, more regularly, but it forces you to let go. Yeah, which I'm terrible at, mm. and just accept. I'm in here for ninety minutes. You know, mm. I can't do any of the things that you know I want to do. You know, or, or my brain's going. Oh, make sure you do this when you get out. Make sure you do that. Um, it's a very um, zen-like state that you that you typically come out in. Yeah. In my experience. You don't get scared being left alone with your thoughts? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was fine. Sweet. All right, that's a good tip. I think yeah. I'm going to have to try it out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Justin, it's been fantastic. Thanks for being on the podcast with us today. Where's some other places we can find you in Talent Um, Yeah, thanks, Jack. Um, some other places, well... Yeah, obviously, um, I'm online. We're all over kind of, uh, you know, social media, quite active across kind of LinkedIn and that also. But, mm-hmm. uh, you know, quite active as well in the Brisbane, well, the Queensland startup scene as well. You know, really love it. Really want to see this place mm-hmm. be creating the next uh, big unicorns. And, and I really think, you know, Brizzy is a good place for that. You know, we're yep. punching above our weight. There's more startups here than there are now in Melbourne. So um, it's a good good place to be. And, yeah, hopefully you bump into people around that. And the website is? Uh, talent Vine, so it's uh, talent v i n e. Yep. Uh, dot com dot au. Awesome, Justin. Nice. It's been amazing. Thank you for being with us. Thanks very much. Loved it. Cheers. See ya.